Hey everyone. <clears throat> so today we're going to talk about um, what anthropology is, but before I get into the PowerPoint for this lecture, um, I just wanted to reiterate what I posted in the announcement on Monday. So I had received a handful of um, emails from students regarding some confusion about the textbooks, and I know like the whole setup is already a little confusing with some of them being ebooks, some of them being hard copies. Um, but apparently, and, and hopefully you read this in, in the announcement, was that the the issue was that because these courses were originally scheduled to be on particular campuses, you have to go to the bookstore webpage for that specific campus to get the books for this course. So this course was originally, I guess, scheduled to be on the North Las Vegas campus. So just like I showed you in the um, in the announcement, if you go to the bookstore webpage and then you scroll all the way down to the bottom, you can pick which campus and then you shouldn't have any problems finding the books for this class. Um, so sorry about that. Um, obviously this is the first time this has happened because it's online, like, it just, like you know, we were scheduled to be on campus and it was online and so there's just confusion. Um, but uh, just to kind of ease your concerns about this, remember that, um, I mean, you obviously we're gonna be, I've assigned reading, but I, I've already assumed, even before this weird thing with the bookstore, I already assumed people are waiting on, you know, books to get delivered, um, financially to come in. I'm assuming you guys don't have the books, all the books on the first day of class. So remember that your first assignment is the syllabus quiz um, and that you just need the syllabus. So all you need access to is, is Canvas. So you're fine on that. And then the next thing is the writing assignment, which is um, based on the, oh my God, I'm blanking, an annual editions. However, in anticipation that people would still be waiting for books, I've already uploaded the first annual edition assignment, like the article. Um, in files, you'll see it. So um, whether there was an issue with the bookstore or whether you're still waiting because you ordered them on Amazon, whatever it is, that first article is uploaded already for you. So, so in an, I anticipated that some people would still be waiting on, on the book. So if you're worried, don't stress about that. And if there's still some issue later on, please uh, feel free to email me um, and just let me know what's going on. But that hopefully resolved that issue. <sighs> okay, so we're gonna start the document, or the document, the <laughs> lecture on what is anthropology. Oh, just just real quick. Uh, so, I know I mentioned this before in the I think the introductions PowerPoint, but when I was going through chemotherapy, I you know, I lost all my hair, and I be, right right before chemo, like the week before I started, I knew I would lose my hair, so I purchased a couple of wigs, thinking I'd want to wear them a lot and to feel normal. Little did I know that when you're going through chemo, you feel like shit all the time. And uh, the last thing you want to do is like put makeup on or put on a wig, you know. There were a few times I wore them for sure, but um, it wasn't really until after chemo, after my hair started growing back and I started feeling better that I actually got a little more into, into wigs. So some are like really inexpensive, some are a little more expensive depending on where I purchased them from, but it's a fun thing to do. So, so while my hair, you've seen my hair, a lot, it's blonde. It, I'm not naturally a blonde, I'm naturally a brunette, um, but I've, been, I've had it blonde for a while, like a year now. Um, I will on occasion, you know, have a little fun with it, so. But it's still me. Okay, so now moving on to the PowerPoint on what is anthropology. Um, so just like before, you hopefully have me and then you have the PowerPoint you know, pulled up next to you or however you choose to do it. But when I am looking off screen like that, it's because I'm looking at my PowerPoint. Um, and just like before, I think I, I said this a couple times just to, so you're like, in case you forgot. The reason I'm doing it this way, like I said, is, is I've seen other colleagues do it different ways, use different apps, and the video quality isn't always that great. And um, if, when you can, when you are able to like um, have like, oh, what's the word I'm thinking of? Like have it to where you can like mirror your video, oh my God, record your, your screen. And so you like say you could, I could, there's an app where I could have my face at the bottom in a little video, but you could be seeing the PowerPoint. Like I've seen those and the video quality isn't that great and I don't know, I just like this, this is better, this is better for me, it seems like it's better for you. In fact, last semester I had students say they preferred it this way, so I'm hoping this works out. Anyway, so I'm gonna be referring off screen to this PowerPoint. Okay, so what is anthropology? Okay, that's the first slide, uh, slide one. Okay, so slide two um, on this PowerPoint. Okay, so what is anthropology? So I think I mentioned this before, and forgive me if I, if I say that a lot because I'm teaching 102 course and in fact I think I have some of you in like both courses so like if I make the same reference or like the same joke I'm sorry you just have to hear it twice but sometimes I'm thinking did I 
say that in the video for the other class or did I say it in this? So sometimes I might, like I just said, like, I'm not sure if I said this already, but um, I'm not sure if I said this already to you guys. I think I might have. Um, but when I took intro to anthropology, um, I took, when I took my very first anthropology course, it was intro to physical or biological anthropology. I didn't know what anthropology was. I needed a science requirement for my associate's degree. I had no idea what it was. I signed up for it because it was on the list, science classes, and I totally fell in love with it. I ended up changing my major. Then I took all the other intros, like intro to cultural, intro to archaeology, all that, transferred to university. Like before I was a fashion major, I was going to go to art school and I, it completely changed my life. And then I got a bachelor's in it and then a master's degree. Now I'm working on my PhD. So if you're coming into this class thinking, I just signed up for it because it was on the required list and I picked it, I'm not really sure. Or maybe you kind of had a vague idea. Like don't feel bad or weird about it um, because I didn't know what anthropology was when I took my first anthropology course. So um, it happens. Okay, so what is anthropology? So in general, we would say anthropology is the study of humans. Now it's a very general statement. Um, so because of that, because our field, like our, our general larger field of anthropology is the study of humans, we've broken that down into four uh, subfields or subdisciplines. So they are listed here on this slide too. Biological, cultural, archeology, span and linguistics. So for this class, obviously this is the intro to cultural. We will be spending the majority of the course talking about cultural uh, implications of that. But also, and this will be a theme kind of throughout the semester, you can never really separate fully the cultural from the biological. So there's often going to be an influence of one on the other. And if you're taking the intro to physical or biological anthropology with me, you'll, you'll see that I, I've said that already. But also in that class too, we'll be talking a little bit about the cultural stuff. And in this class, I'll be pulling, pulling in a little bit of the bio stuff. So you can never really separate them fully. And that'll become clear once we start getting into some of the, um, the different topics. Um, but so the, those are the four subfields, biological, cultural, archaeology, linguistics, and this PowerPoint is basically dedicated to kind of going over those in general, um, looking at even within those subfields, like what are the sub subfields within those, and just so you have a, be a very well-rounded idea of what anthropology is, and then we'll go on to some like key concepts in anthropology as well. Okay, so slide three. Okay, so we're going to focus a little bit on bio, biological anthropology, and I'll just talk about a few of the subfields. Um, but in general, biological anthropology, so this is looking at the evolution of humans, um, behaviorally sometimes, but typically like physically, anatomically, physiologically, morphologically. And also looking at like our ancestors, so those species that came before us, either like directly in our ancestry or like slightly indirect in our ancestry, and our, our current living relatives as well, uh, so like chimpanzees, for example. And there are multiple subfields, and I'm pretty sure if we move on in the slides, I talk about some of those subfields. So slide four. So the first one, paleoanthropology. So I am a paleoanthropologist. I'm pretty sure I mentioned that in the introductions uh, PowerPoint, but that's what I do. So I am, so thinking in terms of all of anthropology, I am a biological anthropologist. And then within biological anthropology, there's multiple subfields. I'm a paleoanthropologist. So for paleoanthropologists, we're studying at, uh, all the hominins. So there's gonna be a lot of terms I'm throwing out in this first PowerPoint. Don't be overwhelmed with a lot of the terminology if you aren't, aren't familiar with it. Um, this is, like I said, a very general overview, but I do have, kind of excited about using this. Okay, so I obviously don't have you guys in a classroom and I can't, you know, start writing on the whiteboard behind me. So I have purchased this cute little whiteboard that I will occasionally, when I think of something, like I thought of something right now, that's not on the PowerPoint that I just wanna make clear to you, either maybe a particular word or just a visual of some sort. I will use this for you. And this is why also it's important, I know I mentioned this before, it's important to not skip the videos because while the PowerPoints have a lot of the information, a lot of it's just a bullet point word and I need, you're gonna miss me explaining it and you're also gonna miss the occasional little thing I add to it. Okay, so for paleoanthropologists, they study hominins and you might be thinking, well, what's a hominin? So think. So humans and our closest living relative are chimpanzees. Chimpanzees are not our ancestor, but we share an ancestor with them. We evolutionarily, we split from chimpanzees about six million years ago. So here's a nice visual of that. So we have humans, chimpanzees, six million years ago. And imagine these two lines are just like time and the evolutionary changes that are occurring uh, on that timeline. So for 
Oh, my one thing. For paleoanthropologists, hominins, what they study is essentially everything in that lineage, everything in the human lineage since the split with chimpanzees. Now, sometimes, like, I might, for comparison, look at modern Homo sapiens to compare them to, like, I look at a lot of stuff earlier in our genus, like Homo neanderthalensis, uh, Homo uh, heidelbergensis, Homo erectus. Um, and often we'll look at it, we'll look at modern Homo sapiens as, like, kind of look at trajectories or trends and in, in evolutionarily. Um, but it, you don't have to pull in Homo sapiens, and most of the time your focus is in Homo sapiens as something else. Especially if you're, if you're a paleoanthropologist like my advisor, who focuses like, you know, three, four million years ago. You might pull in Homo sapiens as a, as a comparison, but it's, you don't have to. But anyway, so for, for, for a paleoanthropologist, they're focusing more on, on that. Okay. Um, and like, like I said, some of these, there's a lot of terms. So like if you're looking at the PowerPoint, you're like, Neanderthal, Australopithecine. Maybe you're like, how do I even say that? Don't stress about that right now. Um, we're gonna spend, I think we have a whole PowerPoint one day where I talk about just some, some background in bio. So we'll be more familiar with these terms. Like I said, this one is just a very general overview of, of what anthropology is. Okay, so next slide, slide five, human osteology. So human osteology, pretty much any biological anthropologist has to have a really strong background in this. And if you decided, for example, ooh, hiccups, that you wanted to go into biological anthropology and you started working towards like a bachelor's, for example, or a master's, you would have to take probably, depending on the university, but like, for example, like myself, when I went to CSU Sacramento, I had at the, at the bachelor's level and the master's level multiple um, osteology courses where you learn all of this. So I have a couple of, uh, I have a couple of bullet points listed, and most of those terms should be familiar to you, like age, sex. Um, there's a lot you can tell by looking at bones, um, but there's a few other words like stature, so that's height, so you can tell someone's height based on the bones. You don't need the entire skeleton if you just had um, one of the bones at the legs. The femur is the best, but you, if you also had the tibia or the fibula, even bones in the arms, you can determine someone's height within so many centimeters. Um, pathology, it means disease. So not every disease affects the bone, but many do. And so often if there is evidence on the bones, you could say, well, this person had, you know, tuberculosis or something. Um, and then ancestry. So in anthropology, we use this term ancestry. In common conversation, you might use the word race. Those aren't, they're not really the same thing. And we actually spend a whole day talking about how they're not the same and why the term race doesn't really work in terms of like how we understand it historically. We'll get into that another day. But basically as anthropologists, we understand that, especially thinking in, in terms of like, we have a very globalized world. We move around, it's very easy for us to move around. But in the past, thinking in terms of like evolutionary past, people stayed for generation after generation after generation in the same area. And those people ended up having ad evolutionary adaptations to that area, whether it was high elevation, low elevation, really hot, really cold. The main food source was plants or the main food source was um, marine food, marine life. So it just depends. So we have adaptations to that. So you can often tell some of that from just looking at the bones. Okay. And some of that's probably familiar to you if, you, if you've watched like, in, like, you know, the show bones or forensic files or any of those, probably familiar. Okay, the next slide, slide six, primatology. That's kind of in the name, that one's easy. Study primates, so of course, humans, we are apes, we are primates. Typically, primatologists look at other um, primates, sometimes with a comparison to humans, but not always. So they often look at, you know, the uh, oh, blinky, uh, anatomic or morphologic evolution through time. A lot of them focus on like primate behavior Sometimes comparing that to humans, so that's always really interesting research. Let's see, slide seven. Behavioral ecology. Um, actually, let's, let's just skip that one for now. There's a lot. Of, I, I'll go on a tangent for sure. Okay. Um, okay. Eight. Evolutionary psychology. So evolution. So if you've ever taken like a Psych 101 course, you probably had like a very brief section on looking at human behavior. Um, through an evolutionary lens, like why do humans behave the way they do? Why do we, what are, how, why are our thought process, processes the way they are? Often from like an evolutionary perspective, like there's probably some kind of evolutionary, oh my gosh, evolutionary explanation. And I would say as an anthropologist, there's almost always an evolutionary explanation for what we do, what we think, any behavior for humans. I would say it always can be explained by evolution. Um, but evolutionary psychology so focuses on this, and then I just have a few words. Don't worry about some of those. Um, but the theory of mind, so the first one, is just um, this idea that humans and many other animals, but not every animal, um, like we have the ability to 
recognize that we are an individual in the world and that other people, other individuals exist separate from us and that we have our own thoughts, feelings, desires, perceptions, and that other people also have their own thoughts, feelings, desires, perceptions that may be the same from ours or may be different. Um, that might not have been something you actually ever thought consciously about like, huh, yeah, we have that ability. Um, and many other animals do, but not all animals. And a really good test for this is um, like a, some kind of mirror test. Um, so often what they'll do is they'll put like a smudge of like, you know, ink or something on the nose of a, of a usually it's like a one or two year old, like for a human, for example, three year old, four year old. And around age three is when humans start to develop this idea. So they will, they will look in a mirror and see, okay, that's me. There's something on my nose. They recognize that that's them. Um, but like, if you ever noticed like, like your pets looking in the mirror, like dogs don't, dogs are really smart, but dogs don't recognize that that's them. Like they think either they don't, they just don't rec they're like, I don't know what I'm looking at. Or they think it's another dog. Like they don't think that's me, you know, they don't do that. But chimpanzees will do that. And actually we're gonna watch a video on this, I think later in the semester. Chimpanzees do that. Um, a lot of other apes, not not all primates though. Uh, birds, so I don't know if you guys knew this, but COVID, Corvids, COVID, Jesus Christ. Um, like um, crows and magpies are extremely intelligent and they have this ability, um, elephants, I mean there's a whole list. Um, but anyway, so like evolutionary psychology would look into like the development of that, how that benefits us. And then of course looking at things, you know, like general like emotions and personality and different behaviors. Um, how those are all related to evolution. Okay, slide nine, that's just a cute little dog. And, okay, slide 10. So now looking more into the cultural anthropology, which is what we would be focusing on in this class. There are multiple subfields. So slide 11, and I have a list. Oh yeah, we have a, a slide for a few of these. So the first one, medical anthropology. Now when you hear that term, you might think, hmm, Medical anthropology sounds like it should be in the biological anthropology subfield, but it's not. Um, this is because those who are medical anthropologists usually have, like, what they do is they take like a more of like a historical or critical perspective on, on general, on like health and medicinal practices in different cultures, like through time. So I have a list here. So like health and disease, procedures and practices, even healthcare systems, like how does the healthcare system affect us, culture, us culturally? How does our culture affect the way in which we receive healthcare? How is healthcare different from culture to culture? Is it like, what well, we would consider like modern Western medicine? Is it something else? So um, sometimes there's a biological um, perspective a little bit, but typically it's from this, from this cultural perspective. Okay, slide 12, urban anthropology. Um, and so there's a picture here called Beneath the Neon, or a picture of this book called Beneath the Neon. So this was a, a book actually written about uh, Las Vegas and the homeless population in Las Vegas. So this is very interesting. But urban anthropologists will often look at um, what did I say about? this interesting, like the cultures of, of those communities that live in very like urban environments and what that means for us like socially. Um, because you know, for, for the majority of human evolution, we lived in, well, we were hunters and gatherers. We lived in very small communities and we weren't settled in any particular areas for any really any long period of time. That's very different, very different from how that is now. Our populations are quite large. We are settled in certain areas. Like you might move throughout your life to a different city or a different city, but you're not like moving every two days with like just a backpack. Most people don't live that way. Um, but if we are adapted evolutionarily to do that, how does that affect how we behave in a social setting and a cultural setting in like most modern cities? So interesting idea. We'll talk a little bit more about that, like population size and stuff later in the semester. Okay, slide 13, ethnographic analysis. So this is a way, uh, so, oh, so we will be reading an ethnography in this class. The head man was a woman, that's an ethnography. Basically what this entails is an anthropologist decides, okay, I wanna work with this particular population and they go live with that population for a length of time. For, usually it's like a year or two years, it depends, six months sometimes, but it, you know, it depends. But it's a while, it's not like a week or two. It's a, it's a long time and they immerse themselves into that community, into that culture, and they wanna learn a lot about what's going on. Like a different perspectives, like the food, um, maybe hunting, um, the religion, the, the social interactions, um, the family unit, like all that information, and they end up writing a book. So you get, depending on the writer, and depending on like, you know, the, uh, well, depending on the writer really, 
you might get a, a more objective scientific description but often what you get is some scientific objective uh, description and you get this really interesting like personal narrative which is you know some would say oh that's like not real science i would say usually you get enough science and some of them way more so than others um but the personal narrative while it's just one person's opinion is still interesting and there's nothing wrong with that and uh, you know getting a different perspective so ethnographies are really cool in that and that you get kind of both and typically they're short and you get a really good like general overview of a different group so that's always cool and the interesting thing about this like historically for for ethnographies is that when anthropologists a long time ago cultural anthropologists they wouldn't do this they would basically collect stories they'd heard from other travelers and then they would compile a book you know about a group of people based on that that's not that's definitely not science um, we call them armchair anthropologists so of course no one does this anymore it's been you know a long time but so kind of from that uh, anthropologists were like wait we need to actually go live with the people to maybe find out what's going on with them so that's how we see the tr transition to that and you still have see people writing ethnographies but we definitely see more even with cultural anthropologists you see more of it being like strictly data collection and, and analysis but you will occasionally get a, an interesting um, ethnography so sometimes they do both okay slide 14 Okay, so and this slide is just to say that you can be a cultural anthropologist who just has a specific uh, focus on, on anything about that culture or any culture. So your focus might be reproduction and you look at reproductive strategies or practices in different populations. Um, it might be diet and nutrition and you focus on that, but you might look at different populations. So for a cultural anthropologist, you could have maybe just like your thing that you look at and you look at maybe one or two populations or you look at multiple or maybe you focus just on one. But usually you have a, a focus in terms of like a, a particular aspect of that culture that you usually focus on. Okay, slide 15, archaeology. So we talked about bioanthropology, we talked about cultural, and now moving on to the fourth subfield, archaeology. So most of you are probably familiar with this, and there's often some confusion about an, uh, archaeology. So archaeologists do not look at uh, human remains. They only look at, and I have this underlined in the PowerPoint, material culture. So say you, there was a, well you or anyone, unearthed like a, an, an ancient city, and there would be you know, evidence probably of like the, the houses, maybe um, the, the tools that were used for building, um, weapons that were used maybe for hunting or protection, and a cloth, the evidence of maybe some type of clothing, and then probably maybe some, some human bones of the people who live there. Archaeologists look at everything else that's not the human remains. They look at all the other, and sometimes, sometimes that's all you have. If you have like an area that was abandoned and there's no people, no people were living there to die there, so there's no bones anyway, and you just have maybe evidence of like, you know, some structures and, and some, you know, arrowheads or something, and that's all you have to go on, then you can start to analyze that and, and get more information from just that. So, so for archaeologists, that's what they focus on. But there are, you know, like I'm going to continue with, there are multiple subfields within archaeology. So slide 16 and 17, really. So prehistoric versus historic. The, the main difference is for historic archaeology, there is a written record. And prehistoric, there is no written record. Um, so you might be looking at a population, you know, from Europe from, you know, let's say 300 years ago. There's probably a written record somewhere of um, what we call demography. So like who lived there, when, how many, what ages, what sex, um, maybe certain laws they had in place, maybe even like building, you know, information or like um, structural information about like what buildings were up or what religion was practiced or things like that. So when you have a written record, you could say, oh, okay, based on this written record, looking at the actual evidence and we can compare these two things contextually can make more sense. But when you don't have a written record and you're like, all I have are some structures and a lot of really cool, interesting stuff, maybe some tools or weapons, or maybe even some art, you don't have anything to compare it to that those people left you it's a little bit more difficult to, to un interpret and understand the information. So that's kind of the general difference between those two. But slide 18, um, cultural resource management. So we see a lot of a lot of this in Vegas, in the Vegas area, because we have a lot of construction. Whenever there's like new construction, like a new road or like a new uh, building, they usually call in someone from like a CRM. Basically, they have to get someone to officially sign off. Like there's no... Um, 
there are no remains here. There's no like ancient artifacts. There's no, you know, burial site. Before they start building, we have to make sure that the ground is clear of that. Because then if that were the case, they would have to um, communicate with like the local university or the local museum or the local tribe to see if they'd like their stuff or, or what. It would it'd be a whole legal thing, um, as it should be. Um, but so for those who work in Sierra and they're, they're always constantly like checking sites and stuff to make sure that nothing's being disturbed or damaged that shouldn't be. Okay, 19, bioarchaeology. So bioarchaeologists actually are kind of like this interesting marriage between archaeology, looking at the material culture and the biological and like the, the skeletal material. So obviously this it makes a lot of sense. You're looking at both to get a context, to get a context on like what was happening in the whole uh, society, culture, group at the time. Um, when you have, you know, let's say for example, you have, um, let me give a good example. So let's say you're looking at the bones, you're like, wow, their bones seem to be like really, really sturdy, strong, not a lot of, you know, fractures, even the older individuals seem to have really strong bones. And then you have evidence in the material culture of like certain foods they were eating, but like, oh, that's why. So when you have like more information, the better, right? So often it's looking at both of those things in, in context with each other. Okay, slide 20, linguistics. So this is the fourth subfield. Linguistics, of course, just like the other ones, multiple subfields. So obviously in general, this is looking at evolution of a change through time of, of language and the multiple ways that this can happen and also how language and, and culture often interact with each other. Okay, so 21. So historical linguistics, just like with historical archeology, span when you have a written record, this makes a lot more sense. Um, you can see changes through time. You can, be able, you can also start to reconstruct older languages if you don't have a lot of information. So here I have in this picture, not, not the hello, this is dog picture, but the other one, um, that's English from about 500 years ago. Now you might be thinking, I cannot read that. But if I told you that's the Lord's Prayer, which I'm assuming the majority of you, religious or non-religious, probably are familiar with or could easily Google it, then you might be able to pick out a couple words like, Okay, I can kind of see a few words, sure. But but you think just in 500 years, because of you know migration and and um, occupation and war and um, trade and you know all these other reasons why we see languages changing and um, um, adapting and, and evolving, like this is very interesting. Okay, so slide 22, ethnolinguistics. So this is looking at how. Our culture can often influence the way we speak and the words we use and vice versa. So let me think of a good example. Okay, so like when I say, if I said, I think I actually did this in the, in the PowerPoint a minute ago or the video a minute ago. Like I was saying something about back, back in time or something. Like we have this cultural reference. We all kind of conceptualize time that way. Like the past is behind us, the future is in front of us. Um, we kind of, one, we see it directional that way, but we also see it as linear. But what if in your culture, you didn't perceive it that way? For example, what if you perceived it maybe to be linear, but the opposite, like the past is in front of you and you can see it because you already lived the past. You know what it was, you can see it. The future is behind you because you don't know what it is yet. That, like that to me makes a lot of sense, right? Um, so you, the way you would phrase the language you would use would be very different because of that cultural perception, that cultural experience. And also what if time to you was, in your culture was like a circular, then the, the words you would use, the phrases you would use would be very different based on that. So ethnolinguistics looks at those two things together. Very interesting. Okay, so now moving on, so we've covered some of the general um, top uh, sub subcategories of those subfields of anthropology. Now you have a very general, well-rounded view of anthropology and the many, many things that we do in anthropology. Now we're going to move on to some important concepts in anthropology. Um, so one which I kind of was already kind of talking about is what we call number one is the four field approach. So basically, this is this idea that we can never really separate any of those subfields into like we can't ever say. It's definitely not influenced by anything else. Like if you're looking at the cultural um, practices of a particular group, you can't say, well, the biology doesn't matter. Or vice versa, if you're looking at biology, you can't say culture doesn't matter 100%. Now it might only be a small influence, but it might also be a large influence. You never know, it depends on the topic. So basically this four field approach is saying, we're gonna look at anthropology like holistically, like, and whatever we study is holistic, like it's well-rounded. 
Slide 24, number two, evolution, evolution. So for biological anthropology, and if you take this class with me or with any of the other professors, we have a very particular definition of biological evolution. It is a change in allele frequency in a population over time. In fact, I have this tattooed. A change in allele frequency in a population over time. In cultural and linguistics and archeology, span it's not the same definition, but there still is a focus on general change through time. Biology is more specific because we're dealing with like genetics and DNA. So this is a very specific biological process. But for the other ones, there's still a very similar process in that for anthropologists, we are looking at those changes through time, how those changes happen, why those changes happen. That's a big theme in anthropology. Number three, so slide 25, this is, so I already kind of said this, I'm not gonna go through all those different uh, bullet points. Um, holism, so basically looking at things in, in, the, in a larger, well-rounded perspective is, is what uh, holism is. So, so whether that's, you know, looking at the biological and the cultural, but also like looking at things in terms of what's happening in the present and the past. Um, also looking at how, even if you're looking at, let's say you're looking at the art of that particular culture, you're gonna probably see religious influences and hunting influences and social, you know, like let's say marriage and a family unit influences on. So all, even within a culture, the different, the different aspects of that culture will be influenced by each other and influence each other. Number four, ethnocentrism. So this is, this, this topic, we will talk about a lot in this class. So I'm telling you right now, if you hadn't really been only half paying attention through this whole lecture, and you're taking notes or something, put a little star by this. This will be a, a, a topic that comes up a lot in this class, ethnocentrism. So here, this is an example of this picture. It's basically the idea that you feel that your culture, your cultural experience or social experience is somehow superior to all others. Now you might be thinking, I don't do that, or who does that, that's stupid, you know, but we do it sometimes, sometimes it's very obvious and sometimes it's not. But basically it's just, it's this idea that you feel like your way of doing things is the right way, the smarter way, the better way, um, but obviously that's incorrect. So we will be talking about that in more detail, like why that's incorrect to feel that way. Slide 27, number five, so cultural relativism. So this is kind of related to ethnocentrism. It's like the antithesis, oh, I have that, the antithesis of ethnocentrism, so like the opposite. Um, this is looking at, um, having more of an objective approach versus subjective, but, but understanding that every culture, whatever practice they have, there's 99% of the time, there is a very specific reason that they do that. Whether that's the food they eat, whether that's the religion they practice, whether it's the clothing they wear, um, there's gonna be a reason. Sometimes that reason is, oftentimes it's related to like the climate or environment so the clothing, obviously, if you live in a very warm climate, you might wear fewer layers of clothing or maybe lighter colored clothing. Um, it might be related to, you know, the terrain. Do you live in a very uh, um, forested area versus maybe more open and arid? That's gonna influence, you know, maybe how you build your housing structures or how the clothing you wear, or maybe even the religion you practice. Like all these things are gonna be influenced by, like. The way people do things from culture to culture to culture, whatever it is, art, religion, food, um, there's gonna be a very specific reason um, why they do those things. And so cultural relativism is saying, while, that, while you might have an initial reaction of that thing, that practice, whatever it is, seems weird, odd, or even maybe immoral to you, um, one, there's very likely a, a very particular reason why it's done that way in that culture. And two, you really don't have the right to judge um, because you're very 99% of the time you're probably bringing in your, just your ethnocentric view. Now I will say, um, I think, and I think I have a slide coming up in a minute, but I'll say it now anyway. I will say that, well, most of you would say, okay, that's true, but I can respect maybe like say 95% of what you know, whatever culture does whatever thing. But there are a couple, okay, Alicia, there are a couple things that just, can you really ap apply that to? And I would say that's a very good point. And this is definitely a, a discussion that we will have in this class and a discussion that anthropologists, even with their PhDs doing research have. Like, 
is there a line that you draw? You say, okay, I don't care where you're, eat, where you're eating, I don't care what religion you practice, that's, that's your thing. But this one particular practice you guys do is just really screwed up. And I think like you can't justify it in terms of like it's not my culture. So like that, this is a perfectly valid point. And, and just like everything in life and everything in the world, nothing was ever 100%. Um, but I would, I would say probably 95% of the time, this idea of ethno, or I'm sorry, a cultural relativism can be applied. But however, like I said, and, and how I'm assuming you all were probably thinking, there might still be a handful of things. Now, in class, I would ask you to think, is there a point where it can no longer be applied? And I think I actually asked that on the slide in a second. I'll, I'll get to it. So think about that idea. Think about, is can you think of a specific cultural practice where you might say, okay, I get other practices that that, that group does are fine, but there's this one thing that I just don't agree with, like a cultural practice. So think about that. It's going to come up again. Okay, so now we're on slide 28. Um, so when cultural relativism must be, so like, this is just more examples of what I already said, but basically um, in thinking in terms of like when to apply this, um, what is considered attractive. So just beauty standards are gonna be different from culture to culture. And there's no right or wrong way. Like for some, for some uh, cultures, some societies, it might be, you know, being tall and thin is the standard of beauty, but for others it might be being, you know, maybe uh, medium uh, height and very curvy might be the beauty standard. Like brunette hair might be the beauty standard in one society, whereas like red hair might be the standard of beauty in another. So um, you're gonna see differences and not, none of them, not one of them is right or wrong or smarter or better, they're just different. Um, let's see in a second, what is considered appropriate? So like, think of like um, etiquette or manners, like if I sneezed, or what everyone probably say. Like if I was, if we were giving a lecture in class and I was talking and then I suddenly I said, or suddenly I sneezed. Probably like a handful of you would be like, I bless you or bless you, 